Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is Jeff Jones, and with me today again is Jack, and we are here to talk about episode three of American Nightmare. So welcome back, Jack. Thanks, Jeff, and welcome to everyone in the live chat. Glad you could join us uh, for this little journey into a really great documentary and this really horrific story. Really horrific. It's almost like an American Nightmare. It really is. The scenario is something that you would have in a nightmare, that someone broke into your house and tied you up and then stole your girlfriend or wife, right? Like that is actually... Drug you, got you, you know, made you sleepy yeah. or drowsy, yep. you know, you, 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 you cut, so you kind of stay calm and not all ramped up and screaming and yelling. And then put a camera in there to watch you to say <laughs> you can't call the cops or if you do, we're going to harm, we're going to harm her. Jesus. I don't know. Like, if I was in that situation, I'd have a hard time. I don't know. I've seen a lot of crime documentaries. I've seen a lot of forensic files, and I've seen a lot of, like, don't call the cops or we're going to kill. Well, a lot of times they, sorry to say this, but they end up killing the person anyway. So, like, That's right. every minute, every minute is a valuable minute. So, I don't know if I would wait long to call the cops. Like, I would be on it. I'd just be like, I no. Prob- I, I, I probably would. I'm sorry. I probably would. I would call. I would At the end of episode two, we um, the kidnappers warn the police. They say, either you need to tell the truth that Denise and Aaron were actually telling the truth, or we're going to do this again. We're going to kidnap again. And episode two ends up with a report of another kidnapping that seems to be the same scenario. So that's where this one picks up so it's it's june 5th of 2015 it's a a couple months after maybe like 10 weeks after denise's release from uh from being held captive there's another break-in and in dublin california the husband is fighting with people who have invaded the home and there's an attempted kidnapping of a 22 year old daughter which is a similar situation to Aaron and Denise. Um, there was a laser pointing at them as they broke in. So um, we hear this frantic 911 call. Um, when when the law enforcement shows up, the husband is covered in blood. The suspect runs out the back door and hops over the fence. And the offender, the kidnapper, forgot his phone at the house it's almost yeah. like oh my god and the lieutenant uh he rings the mother of the phone like when he just goes through the phone te- and says who okay oh there it says mom okay let's call mom and find out whose yeah. phone this is it's yep. like what it's that simple see when you're doing your job right it can be that simple so it calls the mom, and they identify the attacker is revealed as Matthew, Matthew Muller. He's an ex-U.S. Marine and a Harvard Harvard Law graduate. Yep, Harvard. He's a lawyer, or was. And he has been accused of attempted rape in the past. Now we're really getting some getting some teeth behind their story, some real proof they didn't make shit up. That's not a fraud. Right. This shit really happened. As crazy as it sounds, it really right. took place. So the mother of this Matthew Muller tells the police that he's staying in a cabin yep. near South Lake Tahoe. So the police head out to, to the cabin and they force the door open and they arrest this guy right away. Yeah. Photos are taken of him. The cabin is a mess. The police find evidence linking him to the to the Dublin kidnapping, the one that he was just fleeing from. They locate this white Mustang car that Denise had reported to had been inside. Now, I don't know if they connected to that at that point, but in her story, Denise said, I think I was in a white Mustang. She did okay. say that in the very beginning. They find a blow-up doll that is made to look like a human being. They also find a pair of goggles with blonde hair attached to it. But nobody knows who this blonde hair could be, right? So you're like, what? Like, yep. we know, like we know as viewer, we know that this is Denise's hair. 
Yes. But the cops at that point, they don't. I mean, the, you know, it's this, not an this eye is in two, the sky type two, thing. Th- this this is two different departments. You guys got to remember that two different that's police right. departments that work here. That's right. They're not an eye in the sky. They don't know everything. They don't connect the dots. Um, so we can't really blame them at this point for poor police work because they're just like following what they got. Okay. And then in another discovery, and I think we talked about this earlier about the FBI agent. Um, this is the big, this is the big deal right here to me. Sesma. Go ahead and, go ahead and tell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Sesma is the FBI agent. He, he's the ex. He used to date Aaron's ex, Adria or Andrea. The That's FBI real. agent. And Yes. Was dating the ex Andrea, who the kidnap, who the the original kidnapper said was the target of all this. Yes. How is that, like I just need to say it again, so it's clear in my head, so it's clear in your head. The FBI agent used to date Andrea, who was the original target of this kidnapping. So let's take that back. And this, when this was revealed, my mind directly went to this is who. This this was this FBI agent, and I don't know if it was Andrea or someone else that came to the cabin. That's what I think. I think this was a setup. Now this is not part of. That's never been confirmed or anything. No, been, no. But that I, I, that, that this guy did in fact have something to do with it. Yes. So this could explain how this guy, this mass, this kidnapper, Muller how he knew the details about these people's lives. Uh, it was supposed to be Andrea. Who are you? But to me, once it's, that comes out, he should have recused himself off of the case immediately. Should not have been involved at all. For the people out there in the internet world, let me know what you think in the comments or in the chat. Should this guy have been anywhere near this case? This officer, Sesma, was he a former Marine? Uh, that I don't know if it's revealed or not. I don't it's think not that's revealed. revealed. But, like, that's the question that I would say. Like, does he have a connection to Matt Muller? We find out about this other law enforcement officer, Sergeant Misty Karasu. Karasu? Yes. So she's a case on the, she's an officer on the Muller case. So she's looking for the hair found at, at the Muller's cabin in the woods. And she's having no luck locating like who this blonde hair belongs to. But she finds out about this 2009 case of a 32-year-old woman called Tracy. Tracy who lives uh, in Mountain View and was the victim of a home invasion. She begged not to be raped, and the offender said he was sorry and advised a terrified woman to get a dog and do certain things to avoid being a target. Yeah, who does that? Who does that? Yeah, who does it? They're like, okay, so I raped you, and then I'm like, you should have had a dog. I was going to say, we got the basically the hero of the case keeps investigating. The hero of the case is a woman. Yeah. And and this is a big takeaway for me about it, that it took a woman— to bring this case to a head that it took a yep. woman believing another woman because yep. no man would believe this other woman. And, and, and that was a big takeaway for me. Yep. Um, I don't know if you felt that way. Probably. I, I guess did. so. Yeah, I did. So this Misty, uh, Sergeant Kursau, uh, Caruso. We'll just say uh, that. Yeah, that sounds right. Caruso. That sounds right. So she's investigating this blonde hair. That at this point in the documentary, we're all pretty sure that it's Denise's, but she doesn't know that. So she discovered that she discovered the case, the the Mare Island creeper who operated in a quiet neighborhood, um, harassed a bunch of students and often would peep into their windows and take pictures of them, which kind of sounds like that Kohlberger guy, right? <laughs> it, yeah, I way. mean, I guess guess this guy was hanging around, creeping, waiting till these girls took their pants off taking pictures of them in their underwear and so forth and so on i think they explained in the documentary so Mahler is one of the suspects of that mar island creeper yes 
after these cases have stopped, it coincides with the so-called Gone Girl case involving Aaron and Denise. And this officer, Karasu, makes the connection between the cases and discovers the GPS found in Mueller's Mustang had Huntington Beach saved on previous locations. So she goes, oh, Huntington Beach was in a previous location on this GPS, and she connects it. The blonde hair is Denise's, and um, Officer Karasu is determined to chase it up and calls the Vallejo PD, but gets no answer from the Vallejo PD. She calls and calls and calls. She made numerous calls, and, and no one's answering. And then finally, go ahead. Yeah, and so she she's calling, and eventually she gets transferred and told that, to call the FBI. The Vallejo PD is no longer investigating it. And the feds have taken over the case. Well, remember that. Who are the feds in this scenario? The former boyfriend of Andrea, who was originally the target of this so-called. Yeah. So she is given the number of none other than FBI agent Sesma, David Sesma, and tells him that they have a suspect in custody similar to Denise's. He tells her to send the information and they'll have a look. So we also get some more details about what happened in the law enforcement. And they said that there was no evidence of non-consensual sex when Denise was kidnapped. And I think that they revealed that there was, that one of the, you know, tests that she had taken had shown trauma. Yes. And they put Aaron's phone in airplane mode when he was taken into custody. Airplane mode. They put his phone. He can't receive texts or phone calls when a, supposedly a kidnapper is trying to contact Aaron. Yep. Oh. Unbelievable. And so then it's revealed that the kidnapper did call and the calls would have been traceable to 200 meters from where Denise was being held. Had they done all this work that they said they had done, had they gone through, you know, all these massive resources are being spent, but we've, you know, we're so busy that we didn't turn the phone off airplane mode and see if the kidnappers called the boyfriend. Because, in my opinion, they didn't want to see any other information. They had their guy. They wanted to go home and watch Netflix. Yep. They didn't want to deal with it. We got the guy. Turn his phone off. We, no one's calling. Yeah, you're lying. We just turn your phone off and stick it in the locker. The FBI is not sure if Mueller acted alone, despite the claim that there are others involved. They're not sure. The FBI is not sure, Jack. That they yeah. But isn't it pretty obvious that that he didn't act alone? Well, I, I mean, you know, I, I think that, well, th- to me, it's pretty obvious that he didn't. The, the, how could he know these details? Of that what it all comes back to. How could he know the details of Aaron Denise's life and about, this is supposed to be Andrea. Well, who are you? How could he know that unless he had acted in concert with someone, even if they didn't participate in the actual Kidnapping, it doesn't matter. Someone else helping him with these details? Uh, I'm sorry. And there's no signs of a break-in. You remember what I said earlier? There's no signs of a break-in. So how did he get inside that apartment? He had to have a key from someone that lived with uh, Aaron. Previously lived like, with Aaron. Right, I, who, Andrea. Yep, yeah, that likely still had a key. So at the end um, of episode three, we see that Mueller has pleaded guilty and is sentenced to 40 years in prison for kidnapping, robbery, and rape. And um, Denise and Aaron are actually allowed to face him in court. Um, So that is, you know, that's some justice for them. Um, He was never charged with the rapes in Palo Alto or Mountain View or the Peeping Tom incidences. So feels like there was maybe more that could be done with Mueller, especially if he's this violent criminal. 40 years 
is a long time, but if he, you know, it, you we got to remember this is this, this guy is not unintelligent. I mean, he's a Harvard law graduate, and that's right. You don't you don't graduate from there being a dummy. You got to have some intelligence about you. So in uh, in 2016, Aaron and Denise did sue the Vallejo Police Department for defamation. So it wasn't because they did something wrong in the case. It's because when they went on camera and said, Denise is lying, Aaron is lying, that was a defamation of character. So I think it's really it's important that they never admitted wrongdoing. And the only reason that they settled out of court for $2.5 million is because they got him on a defamation allegation, not because they did something wrong in the in the actual investigation. Isn't that interesting? Yep. So it is, and there, there's no way they wanted this in a trial. Not Blake had a piece. Of police creative no lawyering, way. I would put that up to. That's creative lawyering to get something oh, yeah. out of the police department. Um, so the chief, Andrew Bedeau, he was deposed in the civil case and, um, he told, he, okay, an anonymous source says that before the press conference, Bedeau, the chief of police told Lieutenant Park to burn that bitch, referring to Denise and accusing her of causing a hoax. So, you have the guy, Park, who was the one doing it, but it stems all the way back up to the chief of police, who immediately just thought, oh, she was the problem, and we need to burn her. No officers were disciplined in this case. And, you know, just a reminder, the reason they got money was not because of wrongdoing in the investigation. It was because of the defamation that they said on national TV about them committing a hoax and that was defamation of character you know aaron and denise after all this legal stuff is done they do get to meet with uh misty sergeant misty karausu the one who yeah. basically was the only one who would really put the pieces together without her none of this is possible like uh, she's a bull she's a bulldog she wouldn't let it go you know when she once she, she let it go. no i mean she wanted to know who this blonde hair found out too she didn't know anything about this Aaron and, and Denise's case. I mean, there's a lot of details that were, I mean, this is really more of a, a, a summary, but there's a lot of uh, really good police work that happened from just good, honest cops that, that want, that are trying to solve a case and find out about what all this guy's done. And that's, to me, that's what it's about. The investigate, you know, having a, a good cops that don't get sucked down into this tunnel vision of saying, Oh, you're, you're just a damn liar. I don't believe any of you guys just set this up for, whatever reason yeah it uh it, it really is a i, I think a, a real um eye opening case about what happened what the police did uh incorrectly did the and tunnel vision uh can't be overstated enough it needs to be underscored and dotted and starred and blown up in gigantic bold font tunnel vision and this these people were not believed, and it was handled so badly, as we said in the beginning. Okay, so I wanted to play a little bit of this interview from CrimeCon, uh, okay. where Aaron, Aaron talks a little bit more about the case. For Ben, in that room, the power dynamics are, are so skewed. You're, you think, I mean, I was raised, if you're in trouble, call the police, and now I realize like they made everything worse. Um, and I'm centered, trying to defend myself, but again, like I have to, I need their help because they're the only ones who are going to, who are going to potentially save Denise. Uh, yeah, watching the interrogations, you know, years later and seeing what they said, I'm not looking for a live Denise. I'm looking for a dead Denise. She's dead. All right. I've accepted it. You accept it. She's dead. And at that time, I mean, it's. I think one of the kidnappers was trying to call and no one was monitoring his phone. And just seeing that strategy, being the person who was missing, realizing like 
it wasn't really me that they cared about finding. It just seemed like they cared about being right. And that was really hard to, to swallow. And so that's some pretty damning evidence or some, you know, pretty interesting take on it where she's like, I'm the one that's kidnapped and now I'm watching these, uh, you know, interrogation and they're like dead Denise, dead Denise. They just want to be right. That's what I take from her statement there. They'd rather that's be right. right than than to solve the crime. Well, I think it's fair to show, uh, and now we can say because he's been convicted, um, the perpetrator of these crimes. So there's the picture of Matthew Muller. Yeah. Um, But if we uh, just to finish out the episode a little bit, um, what we were, you know, where we kind of left off at the end here. Um, so Aaron and Denise did. There is, you know, somewhat of a happy ending after we have our, you know, she's our hero with uh, Sergeant Karasu, and then we find out at the end that Aaron and Denise are now married. They move to the coast. Um, for the most part, after they did their interviews, I, uh, Aaron had written a book, and that's the book that they were talking about in CrimeCon, that interview that we showed excerpts from. Um, and Denise has given birth to two children. And so um, yeah. they yeah. hopefully have moved on with their life. But, you know, there's this that little nagging suspicion in the background, like, who are these other people involved? Absolutely. And that, you know, I think you nailed it when you said that the documentarians had some tact um, and they left some things out for the public, I guess, to decide for themselves. Or they just said, you know, we can't do anything with it. Whatever. That's the effect it had. It's up to the public if they want to you know, dig a little deeper as they can from their armchair. Um, but uh, I, I think it. Me personally, I want those questions answered because I'm a. I'm just, I just want the truth. You know, I'm like you, uh, Jeff. Um, I just want the truth. I want the full truth because sometimes that's, as we've just seen here, it's stranger than fiction. So, but, you know, we can only hope that, you know, they've moved on with their lives, that um, everything's good, with, you know, them and the, their children, and they've been able to at least put it somewhat behind them, especially the more traumatic effect that they could have on a person. That would be pure hell, man. God, I can't even imagine. I just don't know how Mueller could have got that information otherwise. I guess it's possible, but I, I haven't made that connection anywhere. If I'm wrong, please somebody point it out to me, and I'm, yeah. I'm glad to change my thinking. Yeah, so put it in the comments or in the chat. Let us know what you think about that. Well, I guess please. we'll just wrap it up here, Jack, and just final thoughts on the, you know, episode three or the entire series. Um, well, I think, take this. well, I think it was a great series. I think it's a, it, it showcases what we talk about. You know, we talk about in other cases, especially the Avery and Dassey cases, but there are other cases too where police get tunnel vision and they're done. They're absolutely done investigating. This is a, this is a poster child for tunnel vision. And a department's unwillingness to say, hey, you know what? We were wrong. Please accept our most humble apologies for doing what we did. But we and, did nothing wrong. <laughs> but we did nothing wrong. Yeah. yeah I, think I, think they, it's a, I think they framed it that way that uh, Denise felt like. So they, they apologized, but they did nothing wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You know, and. Um, <laughs> We take no responsibility for our actions. You, that too. Let's set the example for the community. We take no responsibility for our actions. It, it's it's just insane to me this this entire thing has unfolded. You just uh, you couldn't write it, yeah, any worse. I mean, an actual really good, you know, someone that has the capacity, you know, to, to create these crazy freaking stories that we well, see in fiction. Now they maybe they should make a movie based on this one because there was a they based their investigation on Gone Girl. Now they should make a movie based on this, and then tie absolutely up, tie up loose ends with the FBI agent and the ex girlfriend. I would I'm, I would love to see some. <laughs> I'm actually surprised someone hasn't done that 
because it's such an interesting story. Well, he did write the book, so usually a lot of times they adapt things from books, so, yeah. you know, it ain't over yet. That's true. And this case is not that old. But I do think it's important to uh, also mention that um, Colonel Mustard, Sergeant Mustard, won Officer of the Year. And I'm pretty sure that was 2015. Could have been 2016, but I, it was one of those two years. He won Officer of the Year. Let that let that let that sink in. But uh, yeah, I think this has been a a great thing to to cover. This it's a really interesting, uh, I think, first start to this uh, series that we're doing on looking at documentaries and you know getting other opinions, not just ours, but you know what people in the live chat what they really think. And yeah. please be honest. You know, be now. I'm Jeff and I are big boys. Just just be honest. Yeah, absolutely. Let us know you just you never think. know. Yeah, just you never know what you say may lead us to uh, another whatever. And Which, if you have suggest, if you have suggestions for, you know, a documentary that you'd like us to view and, you know, maybe do a little review, throw it out. You took the words out of my mouth. That's what I was just gonna say, Jack. That uh, at this point I'm saying, hey, what documentary should we review next? If you come up with a good one. Um, you know, there's really no limit as long as, as long as people are interested, we would be happy to review one. Um, and maybe there's something that we missed or there's a specific angle that you'd like us to take. Let us know in the comments, let us know in the chat, and maybe you can join us on a future live stream and you can have your say about what you felt about a documentary. So, um, I guess we can leave it there for today um i just want to say thanks uh to everybody out there for joining us um and and giving your input as to what you think about these documentaries and i'm jeff and i'm jack we'll see you on the next one mm -hmm.